I'm glad you remember that. <laughs> yeah, no, she doesn't say anymore, but just uh, want to be light. So. Okay, so is she the game between my soul singing? My soul singing, yes. My soul singing. Yes. Yes, yes. What? What did you miss that time? Oh, that means you're destined to this time. This is good. I don't have to start this one this time. We won't miss our cues. That blue clock, though, like, why can you not see it? Why does it always... Good morning, Downtown Hope. Thank you. Um, <laughs> my name is Emily. Thank you for joining us here in person and online. Um, today we will continue in our series, Outpouring from the Book of Acts. If you're new here, we are so grateful that you decided to join us this morning. At Downtown Hope, we are a family of faith being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ for the sake of our city and world. We would love an opportunity to connect with you over coffee. So if you look at the seats in front of you, there's a connect card if you want to hand that to one of our leaders, Joey or David, um, or put it in the offering box in the back. We would love to reach out, grab a cup of coffee, get to know you, and learn more about how we can serve you here at Downtown Hope. Now would everyone please stand and join me and the body of believers around the world in the collective reading of scripture. Please read along with me. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Good morning, Downtown Hope. Good morning, Downtown Hope. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures heal below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures heal Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
I'm glad that you guys are here as we um, start worshiping together as a family. Just want to be honest, this morning I was like feeling a little jittery and you know, something was that was not clicking, but Lord, I just, just lifted up to Him and being able to just let that go. And also, there was a group of friends here, right? Already three people just pray over me, put your hand, put their hands on me and pray. And it's just a beautiful demonstration of you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be have all together. Because certainly, I don't know about you, I don't have everything together. That's how I feel right now, right? However, without, you know, uh, spoiling Joey's sermon, it was hitting me really hard. It's like, are you available? Even though, even though you don't feel like you have everything together, God is calling you right now by your name. And are you available to respond? Anybody resonate with me? This one? Anybody resonate? So with that said, it, this, the, the song says, So take me as you find me. All fears and failures fill my life again. I give my life to follow. Everything I believe in now, I surrender. So I want us to sing this song together as we uh, go through that transition. Right, Father, I don't have everything together, but you do. And you will cover me with your grace. All I have to do is respond to that. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. One. sing together.
Who's excited to be here tonight? I, not tonight, to this morning. <laughs> Who's excited to be here this morning? <laughs> All right, so we're going to do a little bit of different thing here. As we sing this song, does anybody know how to speak Spanish? Raise your hand. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not going to ask you to speak it. <laughs> but I am, not, I am going to ask you to sing it in it. Just one part, okay? So here's, here's, uh, here's how it works. So my brother here, Josh, uh, has been serving faithfully in the back for a long time now. He kind of, you know, has an opportunity to pray, uh, play, play and, you know, worship with us. And he also happens to what? Speak Spanish really good. So we're going to learn from him this morning. Just just tiny part, okay? All right, so it's really easy. It's, eres fiel, siempre fiel, siempre fiel, eres fiel, which means you are faithful, always faithful. Um, Got that? So yeah, so yeah. we can do it together now. After, are you guys ready? Eres, eres fiel, fiel, siempre fiel, siempre fiel, fiel eres, eres fiel. fiel. All right, let's do it one more time. Eres, eres fiel, siempre fiel, siempre fiel. fiel. Siempre feel, and as feel. Now, make sure you remember that because it's gonna come up in the song, right? And the other one is, the other one is like this. Sing after me. Oh, 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 oh,
Amen. You may take your seats. Uh, my name is David. I have the gift and joy of serving downtown Hope as the executive pastor. And as we worship the Lord today, as we worship the Lord that is good, it is important for us to do so in the context of the forgiveness he offers in Christ Jesus. And so I want to lead us now in a time of confession, a time of assurance. Uh, we read earlier from Matthew chapter 28 where the disciples gathered. They saw Jesus. And the scripture says they worshiped him, but some doubted. And so in the context of that doubt, Jesus still sends them. And so we're going to unpack this morning what it means to be sent by the Lord. And maybe there's doubt. Maybe there's things we've done that might uh, make us think we can't or we're unable to or we shouldn't. And so confession is an opportunity for us to pour out our hearts to the Lord and confess those doubts, to confess our sin to him. In 1 John, it says, if we say we have no sin, the truth of God is not in us. And so I want to give us pause uh, that we might confess our sin to the Lord. And so would you join me in the quietness of your hearts in confessing your sin to the Lord? Let's do that together. Friends, the, the good news we hear this morning is found in that same passage in 1 John where it says if we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And so that's good news, that we can confess our sin to the Lord and that in Christ Jesus we can be forgiven. And so as the Lord sends us, we are sent, fueled by his grace um, that shows us and demonstrates uh, God's love for us found in Christ Jesus. We're going to continue to worship the Lord through song, but before we do so, I'd love an opportunity just to pray and commit this into the hands of the Lord. Let's pray together. And so, Lord, we thank you that you're good. We thank you that you're good all the time. And we thank you, Lord, that you've made a way for us to confess our sin to you. And so we've done that this morning. And we trust and believe that you've heard us and that in Christ Jesus we are forgiven. And as the scripture says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who who are in Christ Jesus. May that be true this morning, uh, and may we worship you because of that reality. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to invite us to stand as we continue to worship. Uh, we'll be in the back. Our elders will be in the back along with our prayer team uh, for anyone that wants to spend the next few moments in prayer. Let this be a prayer this morning, straight out of your heart, from the bottom of your heart. Oh, never been anyone like you. Ever been anyone like you? You are worthy. You are worthy. Cause there's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. Sing that again. Never been. There's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. There's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. No heart of death can separate. Your faithfulness and endless here. So full of grace and mercy, we sing God is so good. So lift him up. God
As you may take your seats, God is good. So I want to welcome us to Downtown Hope for the benefit uh, to anyone who this may be your first time. Welcome to Downtown Hope. Uh, just a little bit of insight into uh, who Downtown Hope is. We are a body of believers that are being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe that God in Christ Jesus is doing uh, a work of transformation. That through Christ, he's making all things new. Uh, uh, Joey's going to talk about it today, a restoration project. I think that's what you said, right? Is that what you said? Yes. Restoration. Talk back to me, man. Restoration project. Thank you. Uh, and, and so that work of transformation, we believe many of us in this room are being transformed by what God is doing. And our desire as a church is to see that transformation impact our neighborhoods. We want to see it impact our homes. We want to see it impact the city we live in, the world we live in. And so in essence, gospel, uh, Downtown Hope exists uh, because we're being transformed by the gospel for the sake of our city. And so if you're new or if you're not yet connected, Emily mentioned it, there are connection cards in the seat backs in front of you. We would love an opportunity to grab a cup of coffee, hear your journey, and see how we might partner together on what God is already at work doing in this city. Uh, and so we'd love to uh, do that. And so fill out one of those cards. You can either put it in the offering box or you can hand it to myself. Joy will be right here after this gathering, answer any questions you might have, and invite you to our next coffee time. A few things uh, to take note of. Uh, uh, February 27th, last week I asked uh, that we uh, save the date. So we're having a family meeting on February 27th for those that would consider Downtown Hope uh, our home church. It's a time where we gather together as a family. We'll give the financial report from last year. We'll present members, give some high-level uh, ministry updates, and really just have a good time over some food. So come hungry. Um, it'll be a good time. I tend to call it a family meal, uh, but I, I, I've been corrected. It's a family meeting, uh, but I'll be eating. So either way, uh, come to the family meeting for a meal, and we'll have a good time. And so looking forward to it. Really, it's just a time for us to practice. We talk about our five practices, one of those being fellowship. It's a time for us just to get together in an informal way, enjoy a small meal, and hear ministry updates. So I want to invite uh, all of you to that. So the best way to make it known that you'll be there is on our homepage, downtownhope.org. There's a link to happenings. If you go to our happenings page, you'll see where you can RSVP, for the family meeting taking place on the 27th. Uh, additionally, uh, for those that are desiring membership, uh, in March we'll begin our uh, Gospel for Life membership class. And what that is, it's an opportunity for us as a church to equip you uh, as a believer to be a disciple who knows now how to make disciples. And we want to spend four weeks with you focusing in on that. And the fifth week for anyone desiring membership is where we could talk a little bit more about what we believe as a church, our leadership structure, and things of that nature. And so, again, on our happenings page, you can make that known. Uh, I would love to have you. Earlier in our first gathering, Julie Campbell, uh, she shared, uh, maybe you've heard or read about this past, actually yesterday, was a shooting in the old Fourth Ward, uh, fourth, fourth ward on uh, near Clay Street. Um, and so two youngsters, I believe she said 10 years old and maybe, I can't remember the other age, 14? Uh, were shot and it had to be airlifted to the hospital and so we came together as a church to pray for their well-being and so I want to invite the second gathering to also pray uh, we have many friends uh, if you remember Isaac Vineyard planted a church on the College Creek Quarter so he's on that side he lives on Clay Street so we wanted to spend time as a church praying for those two youngsters uh, they go to Annapolis uh, Elementary School and so I know Julie had mentioned that uh, just the community uh, just if we can come alongside of them in any way so I want us to Invite us to pray. So what I want to invite you to do is uh, either with the person you came with, the person you're sitting with, we can spend a few moments just praying for these two youngsters uh, that the Lord would speedily recover them. So can we do that together? We'll spend a few moments in prayer. Let's pray together.
So, Father, we lift up our voices to you this morning to praise, to glory, and to just acknowledge your presence and your power. And we know your presence is in the neighborhoods of this city. And so, Lord, we think about the two youngsters that were shot this past weekend. Um, and, Lord, we just ask for your healing. We ask for a speedy recovery, Lord. And we ask that um, we, in the way best that you know how, can come alongside our friends and neighbors and just uh, be a support and pray for, especially the youngsters at Annapolis Elementary School um, and just the impact this might have on that community. We just ask, Lord, your blessing. We ask for your wisdom. And above all, Lord, we ask uh, just for your work of transformation to continually uh, reach our friends and neighbors throughout this city and beyond, Lord. I pray and ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for praying. Uh, at this time, we're going to dismiss our children to their classes or for their time in the Word. And then I'll invite us to stand as we greet one another and pass the peace. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Hey, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. We on there? All right. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Good to be here with you. And uh, good to have those who are joining us online as well. My name is Joe. I have the gift of serving downtown Hope as lead pastor uh, with an incredible team here. And you made it this morning in the snow and on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> you always have to make a joke about Super Bowl Sunday. We, I'm going to continue this morning our series in the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 13 and 14. And so you can follow along with me. Um, our series is called Outpouring. And in our series, we're looking at what happened, what unfolds after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, and the first followers of Jesus. And if you're following along with us, and I would encourage you to, for those who are here for the first time, maybe just hearing about the gospel of Jesus for the first time, we practice uh, during the week reading the scripture together. Uh, we have a great resource called The Daily. It comes into your inbox Monday through Friday. You can sign up for it on our website. And we're kind of diving into the trees of the text in, uh, during the week. So we're reading and we're deepening ourselves, studying verse by verse. And then we're coming here on a Sunday. We're, we're then discussing it in our groups and our teams through the week. We're a church that gathers on Sundays and we meet in groups and teams all throughout the week. And then we come here on a Sunday and we're, we're recapping a certain section and we're diving into one part of the, of, uh, the passage that we've been reading the week before. So it's, there's, uh, we're, we're trying to think about cohesion and integration so that we as followers of Jesus are both learning the truth of the word, but we're also um, learning how to practice it and how to obey it uh, with our lives. And um, so this morning we come to Acts chapter 13. I'm just going to read the first three verses, which is the bulk of where we'll spend our time this morning, but we'll fan out into the rest of chapter 13 and 14 a bit too. So uh, keep your Bibles open um, or your phones on um, and your minds alert as we dive in together. You guys ready? All right, here we go. Acts chapter 13, starting verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, 
they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And this is God's word. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you and thank you for the gift it is to gather this morning. Thank you that you know each person you've brought into this room, uh, the story of their lives, the journey that they've been on. And we believe, Lord, wherever we are, Lord, whether we've been walking with you for many years or maybe we're hearing about your message for the very first time, that it is your intention and it is your practice to speak through the truth of your word to our hearts, not just so we can fill our minds with information, but so that our lives might be transformed and reflect holistically the beauty and the wonder of who you are and your new creation that has dawned in the world. And so we pray in this time that, Holy Spirit, you would speak to us and you would convict us and you would encourage us and you would expose in us those things that you want to tend to, that you want to work on. Um, you know what each of us need and we trust you uh, with that. Uh, I pray, God, the things that I share that are from you would be remembered and the things that are not would be long forgotten and that you would continue to grow us together as a family um, for your purposes in our city and our area and we pray this in jesus name amen so life is full full for you too uh we have four children katie and i have four children and uh different schools different sports um it feels like we have a thousand things going on can anybody relate to this yeah, probably most of us in the room. Um, and it's, it's often hard to track the schedule of the day. I don't know spouses or friends who are here if you track with um, schedules with so many things going on. Um, in fact, some mornings I ask Katie about the schedule and she just says, I'm really tired right now. I don't really actually want to talk about the schedule for today. And that doesn't go so well because later on in the day, you know, or later on in the week, it causes all pro kinds of problems, right? So, but in the midst of everything going on, um, there's a question that she usually asks me uh, often during the week, sometimes a few times a day, um, sometimes a few times in the hour. And the question goes like this, are you available? Are you available to dot, dot, dot? Are you available to pick up the kids from school? Are you available to grab a bag of pellets, wood pellets on the way home? Uh, are you available to get some carpet cleaner because our puppy did that thing again that our puppy does on the carpet pretty much every day with regularity? I'm not bitter about that at all. Um, my daughter keeps saying, stop talking about our puppy like you don't like our puppy. <laughs> I have to stop that. Um, are you available to walk the dogs when you get home? Uh, are you available to call your parents to coordinate rides with the kids and so on and so forth? And I think we can all relate to this, but this question, are you available? And life is full for all of us. I mean, li life is just going to be full. It's not going to get any less full. And sometimes in the midst of the thousands of small things we have going on, we can miss and we can forget the one grand thing that God is doing in the world. And we believe that God is up to something in the world, and we talk about it week in and week out. It's the thing that we talk about often as a church family, that God has unleashed a cosmic restoration project, as David said, <laughs> where, where he is making all things new. The old is gone, the new has come. And he er inaugurated this restoration project in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's Colossians 1 and Revelation 21. That's the story that we find ourselves in, in Christ. The story is not, let's create a holy huddle because one day Jesus will return. The, the, the story is that God is actively, through the power of his spirit, renewing all things. He's going to wrap everything up. We know not every person, not everybody will experience and be included in that new creation. And that's why we have been called by him to go into the world to announce the kingdom, to announce this new creation to the world. We know that the world that we live in is struggling under the weight of sin separated from God. I mean, we don't have to go far to look on the news or just uh, hear what's happened a few blocks from here just last night to see the dramatic and the painful effects of sin in small ways, in big ways. 
And the question is, how does our world, how do your neighbors, how do your friends, and for those of you who are here who wouldn't identify as a follower of Jesus, like this is a great message for you to listen in on because it's core to what a follower of Jesus believes about the world to be true. How does the news get out? How does the announcement of the new creation, how does the announcement of what Jesus is doing in the world get out to the world? And in the wake of Jesus' death and resurrection, he does the most peculiar thing. He commissions a group of utterly imperfect people to be the instruments through which he would sound the beauty of this new creation to the world. Now, if I were Jesus, I don't think I would have chosen the, the people that he chose. I don't think I would have chosen me, and I, I don't think I would have chosen you all. I'm not trying to be offensive here. But like, it doesn't make sense that Jesus would do that. And yet, this has been his design. In his vision of redemption, he calls his people, his church, to be his community that is sent into the world to be vessels through which the good news is proclaimed. That's, that's Mark 16. That's Matthew 28. It's what we read earlier. It's the anthem cry. It's the last command that Jesus gives his church. The last thing that Jesus says to his people is not sit in a room and sing kumbaya together. He just doesn't say that. He says, I am doing something in the world and I am calling you in to participate in this work. He does the work from beginning to end. And the passage this morning, this little passage, Acts 13 and 14, is a microcosm of that story that we find ourselves in. What we find in this passage is a group of disciples, a band of, of ordinary followers of Jesus who are living radically available, radically available to Jesus' call on their lives. And the question this morning for us is, are we available? Are you available? To Jesus. Are you available to him? And what we find in this passage is, is, is what we might call the patterns of availability. What does it mean for us to be available? And there's, there's about five things that jump out, primarily in the first three verses, but throughout chapter 13 and 14 that we're going to look at here together. Let me just bring us up to speed on how we got here, okay? If you've been following along with us in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 the Holy Spirit pours out, and it starts to cause a major disruption in Jerusalem. These uh, folks who were Jewish uh, by religion have now been filled with the Holy Spirit. The new life of Christ has gotten into them, and they're starting to create trouble in Jerusalem, so much so that we talked about a few weeks ago in Acts chapter 7. Stephen is martyred, persecution breaks out, and these Jesus followers are scattered all over the place to announce this new creation, to announce the kingdom, to announce the kingdom of Jesus and the gospel. Acts chapter 9, if you remember a couple weeks ago, Jacob did a great job. We learned what happened in Acts chapter 9, just high level. Does anybody remember this? Saul's converted, right? So this, this you know, religious, religious, religious as they come, Pharisee, is radically turned to Jesus. And he becomes one of the strongest voices in the announcement of the gospel in the world. He's going to have a mission that we're going to see for the rest of the book of Acts, really starting here in Acts chapter 13. But then something else needs to happen in Acts chapter 10, which is Peter gets a vision, and he's called to go visit a man named Cornelius. David did a great job last week talking through this. And, and what comes out of Acts chapter 10, in essence, is that this gospel is not just for the Jewish nation. This message of renewal is not just for people who are Jewish. It's actually for the entire world. And, and the Lord needed Peter to get this message as kind of the head of the church, right? And so now what this opens up is a doorway for this gospel to go out to the entire world. In fact, the reason that probably most of us are in this room who identify as a follower of Jesus this morning is because Peter heard that vision and didn't resist it. And then what happens here in Acts 13 is where it starts to really open up in a powerful way. So there's a few movements of, a, a few of these patterns of living available to Jesus. What does it look like for this little band of disciples? And it starts in verse 1. They, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers 
Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, one thing I just want to take note of here, which is so beautiful, is if you remember, uh, Jesus said the, the church is a people. The church is no longer just uh, bound to four walls of a temple. And here we get a beautiful picture of this. They don't say that in the church building in Antioch. It's actually the church of Antioch. There were people. The church is people, people. Okay. And the first pattern of being available to Jesus to be part of his mission is that you can't do it alone. We are not called to live life in isolation. Whenever somebody tells me, well, I, you know, I, I have a personal relationship with Jesus, but that whole thing with the church and people, like, I can't do that. I get it because when you're part of a church, it's hard, is it not? It's messy. It's painful. You get dinged. You get hurt. Like, that's just part of we're sinners and we hurt each other. The beauty of the church is we get to reconcile and work through it. That's what we practice. That's what we do our best to practice here. But the church is people, not just a person, an individual. And so one of the beautiful things about being available to Jesus is you can't do it on your own. You've got to be part of a community. That's why we gather in communities. That's why we gather in teams. That's why we gather here on Sunday mornings. Because we want to be part of others around us so that we can find ourselves available to Jesus. Secondly, and, and by the way, let me just say something about this community here. There's tremendous diversity happening in this community. This community is a reflection of the kingdom, okay? Uh, there's prophets and teachers. There's a range of gifts going on here. There's Barnabas, who we know a little bit about, but then there's Simeon and Lucius and Menaean, who we don't know much about except through this verse. We have Simeon, who's called Niger. He's probably from Africa. He's pr uh, his name would signify his skin, his dark complexion. And so, and then Lucius of Cyrene, this is not historical, and it's certainly not in this text of scripture, but some traditions hold. This is actually Luke saying this is his signature to the uh, letter or to the book that he's writing here. Lucius Luke, potentially, is writing here. He would have been from North Africa. Have you ever thought about uh, Luke as African? Not 100% sure if he was or not, but there's certainly a diversity of people in this body uh, rising up. Menean, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, this in the Greek here, he would have been uh, close friends with Herod growing up. And so you have people from different socioeconomic backgrounds as well. The church in Antioch is dynamic. It is not just cookie cutter. Okay, it's messy here and there's a community here and that's part of their availability. They're there together in Jesus. Uh, secondly, they're hearing from Jesus. Verse 2, while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them. Part of being available to Jesus is listening to Jesus. Now, for some of us, this is our practice, but I, I'm guessing for a lot of us, this actually isn't our practice. How often do we take time to pause to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit? That's an uncomfortable thing for some of us. But it is so crystal clear through the New Testament that God wants to speak to his body. And it's right here. They're available, and part of being available is listening. Part of me being available to my wife is listening to her. And if I'm not listening to her, I don't know what she wants me to do. And I would be really bad at guessing at it. <laughs> and yet so many of us through the week, we're just, just go on, just, Next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. Can I, I mean, and as we go through these points, there might be things to jot down. There may be one or two of them that just, you know, Jesus is calling you to practice this week. Is that, is this one of them? Are you going through your week so fast that you're not taking any time to listen? This community that was available to Jesus at their heart, they were a, a community that listened to the Holy Spirit. And then part of their availability is being sent by the Spirit of Jesus. After fasting and praying, verse 3, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So I, I can't emphasize this enough, and I want to I just say that we have tragically domesticated the church. Okay? There is absolutely, the church is a place to come and to grow and to be poured into and to be equipped, but towards the end of God's mission in the world, to be sent out to announce the renewal of all things in Jesus. And so often when we think about a church, and maybe this is you this morning, you think about a church, you think about a people, the, the, the definition of that is it is a community for me to have my needs met and have friends and be safe until Jesus returns. 
And you just don't find that in the pattern of the life of the first disciples. And you just don't find that if you read through the epistles going through. The community is absolutely dynamic and on mission. They are deeply pouring into each other. They are getting filled up to the brim, no doubt, but they are being sent in the name of Jesus. And they are being sent, as the Greek says here, the word ergon, for a work. And this is the vision that we've been talking about since the beginning of the church plant, and especially in this last season, we talk about this metaphor of an estuary. This is, the es this is an estuary text, right? It is a people who are being sent into the world for the work that Jesus has put before them. And that work that Jesus has put before you is going to be radically different. There's not a cookie cutter uh, tack to that either. I mean, it could be stepping into the next cubicle over in your workplace. It could be connecting with your father-in-law uh, miles and miles away. It could be going right after this over to the Old Fourth Ward to find the families whose children were shot last night and to see how you can minister to them. It might be coming with us to Robinwood as the Lord's forming a, a dynamic community in that community. I don't know where, what that is. I don't know what that looks like for you. But as a follower of Jesus, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are absolutely and utterly a person who has been sent into the world to announce the news of the new creation in Jesus. That's part of our availability. This community was available to be sent. Are you available to be sent? Or do you basically have your schedule figured out? I mean, it, are you, would you allow your life to be disrupted this week in some way if Jesus has called you to do that? I mean, one of the most amazing things about this passage, I mean, we, we in the Western American context, I mean, we want to just line everything up and order everything out and get the linear trajectory of this thing. Like, okay, the Holy Spirit's calling us. Let's take the next four or five or six months to kind of plan it out and get all of our things in place. And there's an urgency in the Greek here. Set apart in the Greek, there's an urgency to that word. It's like now. When the king of the universe calls you to go, you don't wait. I mean, if he says wait, you wait. If he says go, you go. If you're at lunch and, and you see somebody out on the street who's struggling or needs, and the spirit of God says go, you go. I want to encourage you, resist the cultural constructs that are often put on us that don't allow us to have that level of flexibility and, and disruptiveness in our lives. I know that's uncomfortable for a lot of us. They are sent, and they are sent as Jesus calls them. What is the work that we're called to do? And, and that work is going to be general. It's going to be, for some of us, very specific. But there's a couple of patterns that come out of this. What does our availability look like as we're sent? It means to live out of the power of Jesus. In chapter 13 and 14, if you follow this journey, and, and by the way, this is Paul's first missionary journey is, you know, historically what this is called. So they started Antioch, which is uh, just kind of in the southern tip of modern-day Turkey. It's a little bit north of Syria. Um, they, they leave from Antioch, which is the first church that was established outside of Jerusalem that we really know about, uh, the first church that, in a way, took global missions seriously. Uh, they, they go from Antioch, and they go to the middle of the Mediterranean to Cyprus in chapter 13. They loop back up into the inland of modern-day Turkey, and then they end up coming back around back to Antioch to give the update to the church of what the Lord did in that time. That's what Acts 13 and 14 is all about. That's the journey they're on. And as they go, they're doing a few of these things. One of the things that they're doing is they are living out of the power of Jesus wherever they go. So when they land in Cyprus, uh, they, uh, there's a, a miraculous thing that happens, and the proconsul ends up believing the gospel. Um, when they land in Lystra in chapter 14, verse 7, a crippled man is healed by the power of Jesus. So they are going from place to place, and they're asking the question, Jesus, how can we be obedient? How can we live out the beauty and the wonder of your gospel with our hands, with our feet, with our lives? How can we extend the love of Jesus to the people around us? 
Because again, if you think about it, this is the plan of Jesus. How does the news get out? It's through you. It's through your actions. It's through your words. The beauty is it's not on your shoulders. That's God's work from beginning to end to do that. But we want to live our lives, again, utterly available to him as we go. They're not just living out of the power of Jesus, but they're also speaking of Jesus as they go. Uh, chapter 13, verse 5, they proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Chapter 13, verse 16, in uh, Pisidia, in the syn- they, they go to the synagogue and they're speaking of Jesus. Uh, chapter 14, verse 7, in uh, Iconium, it says that they, uh, that they continue to preach the gospel. And so as we go, as we're available to Jesus, as we're sent, we're not just to live and embody the good news of the gospel, but we're actually called to speak of Jesus. And let me ask that question. When was the last time that you spoke of Jesus to somebody? And I know it's a really, it takes a lot of courage and it's a really difficult thing to do in our landscape because there's been so many bad examples of people speaking about Jesus, right? But that doesn't actually mean that The word is negated and we don't speak about Jesus. It means we have to rely further on the Holy Spirit and listen. And how can we speak of Jesus? And we're going to mess it up. And it's, again, it's not on us. A friend of mine was encouraging me in this a few weeks ago. And I was just walking down West Street. And I was walking with a friend. And a a guy came up to us. And, um, you know, he had a business going on. And he wanted to uh, sell us something. And he said, man, do you want to get high? And I just, I just took that as an opportunity. I was like, man, listen, do you want to get high? Because I've got something way better than what you've got. <laughs> and, uh, and his name is Jesus. And, and, and like the, the conversation flipped in not a great way, to be completely honest. I mean, he got a little upset with me because now we're in competition for the business on the streets. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and probably on top of that, maybe he, he suspected that maybe Jesus wouldn't want him to do this kind of business potentially, you know? And so he kind of started to get upset with me and my other friend was there and he, you know, it didn't end in fist fight, but I mean, we were, it was, it was like, it was getting a little tentative there for a moment if you're with me, but that's part of speaking Jesus in the name of Jesus and talking to people about Jesus is that some people might hate you for it. And some people might be really offended by that. Some people may get upset about it. But some, people are, but some people have never heard of him before. And some people have never heard of his love. And some people are living in such guilt and shame and condemnation. And they have not heard the good news that God has come to restore them back to him and Jesus. That the cross was sufficient. Part of our availability is to speak his name. To tell people the story. To tell people the story through your story. I mean... Gospel for life, when we're going to be walking through there, again, David mentioned it, but it is practical equipping for you to take that next step in your workplace, at home, in your neighborhood, to learn how to speak about Jesus to friends and neighbors. It's really, we have refined it to just be practical equipping in that sense, because we found a lot of people don't know how to do that, okay? So join us for that. If if that's something you're interested in and, and you'd like to do, we'd love to come alongside of you. So again, they're, they're, they're listening. They're, they're a community that's hearing. They're a community together. They're not in isolation. They're a community that's being sent. They're, being, they're a community that's being sent to speak of Jesus. They're, being, they're a community that's being sent to embody the power of Jesus. And they are a community that's being spent for Jesus. So I love chapter 14 here. And, and please, if you haven't read through this, Read through it. It's, it's an incredible narrative, chapter 13 and 14. Put yourself in the story. Chapter 14, verse 19. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, listen to this, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, suspo- supposing that he was dead. That's part of the cost of... I'm up, you know, I'm, I'm annoyed because the guy, you know, kind of came after me because I said Jesus on the street. Paul got stoned. They, he got stoned with such severity that they actually thought he was dead. I love verse 20, but when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city. <laughs> like, what kind of person is doing this kind of thing? I'm trying, to con- I'm trying to push here a little bit. I'm trying to contrast how we as followers of Jesus have been taught what 
our faith ought to look like. And it is tragically domesticated. Tragi we have taken something that is so wild and so alive and we have put it in a container. And the spirit of the living God who is doing this work of renewal in the world will have nothing to do with that. And I want to challenge us that we might be a body. And again, this doesn't mean we're going to be doing extreme things like, thi like this, but it just means we're radically available to Jesus to, to, to be obedient to him in whatever he calls us to at any given moment. Availability means being willing to be spent for Jesus, being willing to be persecuted for Jesus. And one of the things that the church, local churches practice are, are, are missions trips. And missions trips going here or there for we globally are important things. I mean, the Lord uses those things. But what I'm trying to raise this morning with us is that the world actually comes to your doorstep every single day. And in fact, I, I would even take it further to say not that the, do the world comes to your doorstep every day, but actually you are sent into the world every day because you have relationships and access to people that I never would have and the person next to you never would have. But Jesus has put you in their life regularly through your work, regularly in your neighborhood. And you can't reach the whole world. You can't reach a thousand people. But man, I, I, I know God's heart for the world and I know the heart of Jesus and I am certain there's one or two. There is somebody in your world and maybe you're already walking alongside of them that Jesus has called you to. He actually sends us on this kind of a mission trip every day. Every day is an Acts 13, chapter 13, 14 moment for us. That is the life we get to live in Christ. And it's glorious because the pressure is off. It's the Lord's work. A missionary is simply someone who is sent by the Holy Spirit to do the work set before them. And isn't it amazing to think that today, this day, at the Super Bowl tonight, <laughs> each new day, the God of the universe has a design to send you to somebody that he has in mind who has a need to love them, to encourage them, to spit the gospel to them. Just, just take a moment and think about that. God has commissioned you as his follower to be part of his work in that way. But, but here's the problem. Most of us don't naturally live this way. I know I certainly don't. Why? Life is full, right? Some of us are afraid to live this way. Some of us feel unworthy. My life isn't all together. Nobody's life is all together. Or maybe we practically don't know how. And I want to draw our attention in closing here to something that's really significant about this passage. It's in verse 2 of chapter 13. At the very beginning of the thrust of all the movement around chapter 13 and 14, the mission, the team gets sent out. People come to faith in Jesus. Lives are being transformed. We find that this church, these people, they were worshiping the Lord. Now, the word in Greek here is the same word used in the Old Testament for what was happening, what priests did in a temple. Isn't that interesting? And isn't that amazing that these first Jesus followers took Jesus' word so seriously that the church isn't just a building, but they are the temple of Christ, that they are, that's, um, they are living stones uh, together. It's 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 1 Peter 2.5. And so here they are as a body, as a people, a diverse body, worshiping, living in such a way as the priests of the Old Testament did. So they are inhabiting a temple kind of space in that local body. Now, what was so special about the temple in the Old Testament? What was, what was found in the temple? In the temple is where God's very presence dwelt. Their availability, the beautiful mission that comes out of Acts 13 and 14, is fueled 
by the very presence of God. It doesn't start with their activity. It doesn't start with their ability. It starts with them being in the very presence of God. And I love, I love this Trinitarian presence here in Acts 13. Jesus says, where two or more are gathered, I am there with you. Jesus is there present with this body. The Spirit's presence as the sending agent. The Father's presence in this, the worship of God, the worship of the Father. Their avail availability for mission came out of them being in the very presence of God. Now, let me just tell you a story that I think kind of highlights this. My son, my 12-year-old son, had the chance to play uh, an ice hockey game at the Capital One Arena last week. It's like a cool program they have. You play a game, you go to a Caps game. It was great. So um, they're playing this game at the Capital One Arena, and they just get slaughtered. I mean, it was really, it was really sad. <laughs> it was so sad. It's like, you're in the Capital One Arena, and you just got completely destroyed. <laughs> and and, and this, these 12-year-old boys are just totally despondent, and they're just like, you know, at the end of the game, it's like they don't even want to shake the other team's hands. And they're all down in the corner by the goal, um, like, trying to congratulate their goalie, even this moment of profound loss. And all of a sudden, like, there is this energy that comes onto the ice. And it was like, they, like with way more speed than they played that game, everybody goes to the bench, like, as fast as they can. Like, they, like, full blown. Like, I've never seen these kids skate that fast. And I'm like, I'm looking from like, I'm like, what's going on? Like, I've never seen this happen. I look down on the bench, and I'm like, that's the greatest hockey player in the world who's on their bench, Alex Ovechkin. He's right there on their bench, and they caught wind of it, <laughs> and they got, went as fast as they could to him. <laughs> it, was a, it was an amazing picture, and I, I was reflecting on this some, and I'm like, it was the presence of this great hockey player that compelled this movement and this energy on behalf of these hockey players, these boys. And I'm wondering for us, how much more powerful is it that the God of the universe, who has rule and reign over Alex Ovechkin and every other superstar out there, we have presence with him. And what kind of motivation and what kind of movement and what kind of availability comes out of that? It is the presence of God that leads us to radical availability with Jesus. And that's my prayer for us this morning, that we would live in that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this passage and how challenging it is and the question that, one of the questions that comes out of it is how available are we to you? And Lord, it's our prayer and our desire, those of us who have been filled with the Spirit of God, who have identified with you, Jesus as Lord, that you would cause us to be available. And we thank you that our availability is deeply connected to presence, to being in your presence. So Lord, I pray for my friends in this room um, that as we go about our days, Lord, as we consider the truth of this word and the reality that we have been sent by you, that we would remember the pressure is off of us and that we find a resource in your presence that energizes us and sends us into the world to participate in the work that you are doing, renewing all things through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray this in your name. The most amazing thing about presence is that
God's presence is that it's not something that we have to achieve, but it's something that in love he brought to us through the cross, God with us, Emmanuel. God came in flesh and he gave his life in sacrificial love that we could enter into his presence and be with him and join in his mission. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul recounts to a body of believers in Corinth what we recount and what we practice each week, which is partaking in that remembers this reality that the work is not on us, but it was accomplished on the cross through and through. Paul writes in verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Christ came to be present with you and give his life and love for you. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So in all the ways we are inadequate at being available to Jesus, and we all are, <laughs> he was perfectly available to us through the cross. And in love he died. And in the wake of the cross, we are found to be forgiven and loved and freed by his blood, the blood of Christ for you. I'd like to invite you to stand with me this morning. We're going to partake together over the next few minutes here. We'll come out the sides and down um, back through the middle. Our practice is to come with open hands to receive. We bring nothing in our hands. And our practice is this. If you have identified with Christ as Lord, come freely. You are a sinner saved by grace. Come freely. If you're in a spot, and the scripture encourages us to, to consider our hearts as we come, if you're in a place where you are in full-on rebellion from God and running as far away from him as possible, we are so glad you're here, and this is a safe space to process whatever you're going through. This is also a place of transparency, and we would encourage you to not come. We don't need more fake things in the world, and so just be honest about where you are. But if for the first time you've repented and believed the gospel, come, come freely this morning. Let's partake together. I want to invite us to stand as we uh, reflect and as you're, you're, you are ready.
your goodness. I've seen your goodness on the
my first love is for us. Come, my beloved, and through the years you've been good to me. So. practices and gathering is responding to God's grace through giving, through giving to the work of Jesus through this local body. Thank you for being responsive to God's grace and your generosity poured out. Um, God always provides and has everything we need. Uh, we want to continue to encourage you if you're a member of this body, if you identify downtown Hope as your church home, uh, continue to give freely, uh, abundantly, generously. You can give online or you can give through our offering box in the back. Um, when we talk about worship, we're talking about being in the presence of God and being sent into the world, just as we learned this morning. I just want to give us a few moments to practice what we learned here. So just take a few moments in the quiet of your heart to ask the Spirit of God to bring to mind a person, the places where he's called you. Um, and then I'd like to send us after that. of these folks in our minds and hearts, we recall Jesus' words in John 20, 21. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Lord, we thank you that we are caught up in a story that's much bigger than us. And we're saying we're available to you this week, today, wherever you would send us. Lord, may we go together in community. May we go hearing your voice. May we go being sent. May we go demonstrating the power of Jesus. And may we go proclaiming the news of Jesus, being willing to experience whatever cost that means. You are our reward. You are our all. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name.